and thanks a lot for the invitation. Uh, it's a great pleasure to be here. Um, so I want to share with you um, some uh, d two works, w one very recent, so in progress, and one uh, um, more or less recent, uh, so, so uh, from uh, maybe a couple of years ago. Um, and so, so maybe first I'll give you uh, an introduction. Uh, and second, I want to talk about uh, how to get solutions to multiphase mean curvature flow. Um, so this is going to be a joint work with, uh, uh, with Tilo Simon. Um, and then in the third part, I want to talk about uh, weak strong uniqueness. Um, um, and this is uh, with uh, Julian Fischer. And Sebastian Hensel, uh, and again Tilo Zimmer. Um So Tilo was uh, not far from here at the NJIT and is now in Bonn. Uh, so we met when we did our PhDs in Leipzig. And, and Julian and Sebastian, uh, so I met Julian also in Leipzig, and Sebastian is Julian's first PhD student, very good student, uh, and they're at uh, the IST Austria. Um, so, so let me f first give uh, give some uh, some very short introduction, um, so, so that we are all on the same page when when I say mean curvature flow and multiphase mean curvature flow. Um, so, so I always think of in this talk here of of hypersurfaces. So, we have a one parameter family of hypersurfaces, it's in R D. So, and I'll always think of these as boundaries of some, some set, some open set. So this is the picture. And they evolved according to, uh, so it's driven by surface tension. So um, the velocity, the normal velocity, is proportional to the mean curvature. Um, then usually one puts here um, two material parameters. So the kind of only the, the part in the normal direction is kind of important for the geometry to evolve because kind of the tangential velocity just kind of gives you different parameterizations. So this is the open set omega, and this is the, the boundary. Um, and this here is called the surface tension. Uh, and this is the mobility. Um, throughout the talk, you can think of sigma and mu equal to 1. But uh, we, we'll see in a second just kind of roughly that, that actually it's not redundant to have two constants here. Um, this h is the mean curvature. Uh, so for me, it's uh, uh, the sum of the principal curvatures. <coughs> so uh, you can write this as the divergence of the normal. Um, <coughs> and this is the normal velocity. Um, and, and OK, I think all of you know that. Okay, so spheres shrink under this evolution equation. So that's kind of that we all agree on the sign. So uh, it's kind of uh, is the correct sign so that uh, spheres shrink. Um, but also you can have more interesting geometries happening. Also change of topology that kind of you have maybe two, two spheres connected with a very thin tube. This tube might disappear before uh, anything else disappears. So kind of you can have very interesting uh, uh, things happening. And uh, so what is um, multiphase mean curvature flow. So I always write mean curvature flow. Um, so it's so now I just I have not only one set omega, but I have uh, several sets that form a partition. So it looks like this. So this is omega one, omega two, omega three, and so on. And so they share interfaces which I always give kind of the two indices of the two adjacent uh, um, regions. And then the equation reads, uh, it's the same equation. So um, it's just the normal velocity is proportional to the mean curvature. <coughs> and then these, so this is on each of these interfaces. Um, but then they are coupled at triple junctions by a balance of forces condition. So this, I'm just saying that they're kind of each triple junction is in local equilibrium, um, which means that uh, if I sum the 
over all adjacent pairs. So for example, here um, I take the normal of sigma 1, 2, sigma 2, 3, and sigma th two, 3, 1. And I sum them um, with these prefactors, this is going to be 0. So if all the surface tensions are the same, I just have 120 degrees angles at tri triple junctions. And you should really think of, I'm sorry? Um, so, so you can think of this as one slice through the domain. Um, so then these are surfaces. These are volumes, right? These are the interfaces are surfaces, and these triple points are not point; they are lines, right? But it's the same equation along these along these lines. You will have these uh, this condition. Well, it's generically fine, but there might be other junctions as well. Um, so, so the first result actually doesn't even see this. So, so the first one kind of gives you is very general, but also very soft. And the second one, we have to be very careful. And there, actually, um, we, we actually do this in, in, in the plane. But, but now there, yeah. so you're summing over, you're summing over like i less than j, or like you know. Um, yeah, I mean, so so. It cannot be symmetric, right? Ex exactly. I mean, you, you, you choose okay. one order so to go through here. Cycle. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, uh, and this is along these triple junctions. So and this is just along the top dimensional. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. So they, they meet at lower dimensional junctions, and this, there's no extra condition there. OK. okay. So um, why, is this, why, why do I think this is an important equation? Because uh, in material science, this is where also where this showed up, um, is that um, this is a, a, a phenomenological but, but very important model for grain growth. So each of these regions um, would, in a polycrystal, correspond to a region where you have basically one um, crystal lattice on which the atoms sit, and then they are separated by almost, I mean, almost uh, lower dimensional uh, um, surfaces, and and they, when when kind of when you have enough heat in the system that they can just still migrate, you get uh, grain boundary motion, and this is uh, this is exactly what happens here. So this grain growth. So some of these grains will grow, others will shrink and disappear. Uh, it's a very complex. Uh, problem when you look at simulations, there's a lot happening, but um, the equations are very simple. <coughs> so that is, uh, oh yeah, um, so, so one very important observation is that this has a gradient flow structure. Um, um, so the energy um, is just uh, so, so I sum over all these um, um, pairs of indices, let's say maybe i less than j. Um, and I just so take the area of these interfaces weighted with the, with the surface tensions. That's the energy. Um, so you see th the anisotropy comes from the energy. And the mobility, I mean, actually, so people write it like this, but actually the mobility should be with a 1 over on this side, because it really comes from the from the uh, uh, from 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 the metric structure, so from the kind of the, the L2 structure that we put on this uh, space now, um, where kind of the tension space we identify with normal um, these normal vector fields, and at such a um, uh, uh, at such a configuration, this is just one over mu ij. So formally, this is very easy to verify that this should be true. Um, but one has to be very careful, because um, this is completely degenerate in this case. So whenever you want to use this, you have to be um, somewhat careful. Okay. <coughs> so um, one nice way to, to approximate these, these, uh, these partitions, or even you can always think of this case if you want, um, uh, these phases, is the Ellen Kahn equation. So you, you're looking for a function of x and t that solves uh, just a reaction diffusion equation um, with a fa fast reaction rate. Um, and you can actually think, uh, so you should maybe right away think of this as a system of equations. And, and w is a. Potential, so this goes from Rn 
to the non-negative real numbers. And, uh, and the important thing here is that it just has finitely many zeros. Uh, let's say 1 through p, p for phases. Okay. So this is the allen kahn equation. So it's just um, you have diffusion and very fast reactions, so epsilon is small. <coughs> and this is just the gradient with respect to the u variable. So also this has a gradient flow structure. So all this is very uh, well known. Uh, uh, so the energy is just. Uh, maybe let me just put a two here for later. Um, it's just. Dirichlet energy plus the, the potential part here. Yeah. Um, and this, uh, the, the metric is uh, just actually L2 uh, weighted with this epsilon. Okay. So it doesn't depend on where you are. So this is really just in a, in a Hilbert space. Uh, but it depends on epsilon. This should be del. So th this, you can check, for example, that uh, right. um, this is always dx here. Um, so, so now what is really the connection here is that um, um, we know very well that, that this, this Kahn-Hilliard energy approximates uh, the total interfacial area. So these, um, these phase fields here, the u epsilons, they will take values in most of, so you have some fixed domain, it will in most, reg um, most part of this domain it's going to have constant values and then very sharp transitions from one value to another one. And, uh, and you will see basically almost these interfaces. So diffuse interfaces of thickness roughly epsilon. Uh, so, so there's extremely, uh, there's a lot of uh, previous work, and uh, I can just mention a, a couple of works. Uh, so this is selected. Um, so so Craig Evans, uh, Metisona, and uh, Taki Suranidis uh, proved uh, um, convergence to the viscosity solution. Uh, so viscosity solution. Um, then uh, Tom Ilmanen uh, proved convergence to a Bracky flow. And then maybe one more work I would like to mention is uh, uh, Bob Cohn, uh, um, Leah Bronzard and Bob Cohn. Um, so, so they, they uh, write down very well the, the gradient flow structure, prove some compactness. Uh, and then apply this to the radial symmetric case. Um, but uh, really, this is maybe the, the this compactness, and uh, this is maybe the, the interesting part here. Um, and there are many more. Uh, and so this is for mean curvature flow. And then maybe I should also work uh, tell you about the static case. And it's again uh, very selected. Uh, uh, so you can prove uh, that these energies really converge. So in the sense of gamma convergence, um, so this is, goes back to Modica Motula uh, and many others later. And then one very nice work by Sisto Baldo. And maybe I should tell you what kind of the restrictions here we have here. So all this is in the case n equal to 1, so just for one equation, so not for, for a system. And this here is um, either n equal to 1 or at least uh, p equal to 2. So some of these works later here for especially were um, also kind of vectors, vector valued, but then still p equal to 2. And this is uh, very general for any n and p.
And let me roughly uh, give you the, I mean, so maybe I first tell you our theorem. So this is Tilo. Uh, um, so um, so first we have uh, compactness. Uh, um, so so sorry, if you, if you take any, could I mention that you have to normalize in a different way? So, so, so the the interest no 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 so, so the yeah. the W has these has finitely many wells, so the co-dimension will be one. But but you will have value alpha one here, ah, alpha okay, two, okay, okay, alpha okay. three. Yeah, sorry. Yeah. So 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 this is this is one of the difficulties here but maybe. So this is one. Not going to, to, to higher dimensions. Um, sure. in another talk. But okay. yeah. Um, so so here. Um, um, so so the, the meta has a, a very nice work uh, with uh, Ambrosio um, in higher co-dimension also. Uh, so so, so um, yeah. you, I mean, th it's really a big difference if you have here finitely many wells or really a continuous. Uh, yeah. So so then really the the I mean to get the the correct energy you have to uh, okay, rescale okay, okay. with the logarithm. That's right. Okay, okay, okay. That's finitely. Yeah, and that's and that's somehow something one has to keep in mind when people prove these things for um, for the systems case. One really had to be careful. One somehow has to use that one is in this case and not in this uh, no, continuous then case. Yeah, yeah. Then, then you have to exactly. With yeah. the right. Exactly. Um, so the compactness. Uh, so th so that's very simple. So so let's say if the initial conditions u epsilon zero are uh, well prepared. Uh, um, so if. Uh, there exists a subsequence, uh, um, and and u, which is a function that takes just uh, values in these wells alpha one to alpha uh, alpha n. So you can write it as a some partition. Um, such that the u epsilon converges to u in L two or um, And and then uh, the second part is um, kind of really the the I mean so, so you get convergence to something but I, I always call this convergence so somehow the limit satisfies the equation um, that is really the the key point here um, and and uh, so, so this is a, um, a conditional convergence result I'm going to show you now um, so if additionally I know uh, I have some finite time horizon such that until this horizon I know the energies converge. Then U, or kind of the partition that corresponds to U, um, satisfies multiphase mean curvature flow uh, in the dis distributional sense. Okay, and I'll tell you in a moment what this means. Okay, so that's that's the theorem. The first one I wanted to show you. Uh, let me just write down here the uh, uh, so that means uh, so first of all, um, kind of I want to say that there exist normal velocities and that there exist these mean curvatures such that this is true, and this is true. So somehow, this is really the, the I mean, this, this balance of forces condition here is really natural, the natural boundary condition for, for the mean curvature here. So somehow, we first are going to encode that v is the normal velocity, and then we can encode both of these, the equation and this balance of forces condition in one distributional equation. So for every i, so for every phase, one, two, and so on, um, there exists a vi, which is the normal velocity for this for this phase. So vi is positive if the phase is growing and negative if it's decreasing, if it, if it's shrinking, um, such that uh, we have. Uh, when I give you a test function, integrate this over omega i. Um, this is just. 
んですよ。So the vi's are the normal velocities in the sense that they behave like the normal velocities, as you know from from calculus. That um, uh, so, so when I take take the derivative of 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 this guy here of the, the how the set changes, it gives me velocity over the set over the boundary of the set. So in other in other words, this means that um, these characteristic functions here, um, they their time derivative is a um, is a measure and it's absolutely continuous with respect to the perimeter, perimeter measure and that's the density. It's one way to put it. Uh, so, so this is a L2 function uh, with respect to the measure here. Um, and th so that's the, the, the first one. And the second one is now I want to encode the, the actual equation. And that is for every uh, test vector field, let's say x. So x is um, nice and smooth. Um, so th this is for every zeta is a test function here. So one. For every test vector field, um, we have, when I take the tangential divergence of this guy, um, um, so if I just had one interface, then this would be the, this would be the equation. And now because I have interfaces i and j, uh, I will sum here over these guys, sum over i and j, and I put here the sigma i and j. And here you can choose i or j, it doesn't matter. So the, the, the velocities will always, I mean, on the interface, they will be, vi will be m minus vj on that interface. Um, so so that's, that's, uh, that really encodes uh, um, this one here. And the second condition, because uh, if, if everything was nice and smooth, I could integrate by parts, I would get the mean curvature here. But then I have a boundary term. And this function here is really an L2 function. It's not a measure that concentrates on this lower dimensional uh, set. So um, this gives you an, an extra condition, which says that these terms have to be 0 themselves. Okay. So maybe I should justify why uh, why this is interesting, because especially because of this, the second part is um, a conditional result, right? I'm saying if I know that the energy is converged, then uh, this is true. So um, maybe I give you first uh, a first good good reason. So so uh, the result is so so the result is similar. Uh, uh, to uh, result by Lukhaus and Stutzenhecker, uh, which uh, I think is very beautiful. Uh, it's uh, for this, this implicit time discretization for mean curvature flow that independently Lukhaus and uh, Stutzenhecker worked on this, and Fred Armgren here with Gene Teller and uh, Yu Wang, uh, they uh, worked on this. So this is the um, uh, same scheme uh, as Armgren, Taylor, Wang. So that was uh, the implicit time discretization. Um, so the re result is somehow really the same. Uh, OK, you have some compactness. But the interesting thing is, if you know that the energy is converged, then um, you can verify this equation. Um, somehow, uh, but, but uh, here you really need. Uh, the proof needs uh, uh, regularity theory um, for almost minimal surfaces. Um, and uh, it's, it's, I think, not as, as simple as our proof, because I mean, also, this is, this is easier, I believe. Um, um, I mean, this is definitely easier. And 
uh, but it's kind of a very nice and robust proof that we have here. Um, and, and then there's another uh, uh, work uh, that I had with uh, uh, Felix Otto um, for the thresholding scheme. So the thresholding scheme is uh, like really a, a numerical scheme, uh, even more efficient than if you want to compute uh, um, the, this, this phase field. Um, so this is by uh, Merriman, Benz, and Osher. Uh, so what you do, you take your partition at a given time, and then you want to evolve this. What you do is you um, solve the linear diffusion equation, uh, and then you do a pointwise, very simple operation uh, called thresholding. Um, so I'm, I won't explain this in detail, but here one very important observation was um, has uh, the same structure as this scheme here, as the Angwin Taylor Wong uh, uh, Lukas Stutznecker scheme. Um, and this is an observation by uh, Salim Ezidulu uh, and Felix Otto. Um, this is, and th this was really the basis of our proof that it can also be seen as such an implicit time discretization where you kind of, um, that comes as a, a kind of a se sequence of minimization problems. Um, so of course, if you want to implement this on your computer, you don't want to solve the minimization problems, but it's really an efficient scheme, right? So you can just compute, I mean, convol convolution with a heat kernel and so on, that's very simple. Uh, but kind of, if you want to do the analysis, then this, uh, uh, this interpretation as, as kind of something that really respects the gradient flow because it's kind of really this, uh, this minimizing movements, this implicit time discretization is extremely helpful. Um, So maybe let me say one word about this. So here, um, what we do there in this proof is we estimate the error um, against, so for a fixed time step size, we kind of do manipulations and kind of try to bring it into a form that looks very similar to this. Um, and kind of the error functional that we use is the um, kind of the, um, the, the energy axis. How much more energy do you have as than a half space? So something like the area of whatever set you have, so let's say sigma, in some ball, let's say, minus uh, the area of some, uh, and this here is uh, a plane. Um, so, so you know this uh, from geometric measure theory, I believe uh, that this is, uh, very useful tool. And uh, uh, here, um, so for in our case here, um, it's a very soft proof. Um, and uh, the uh, maybe the main observation here is we can, we, that one can not only use something like the um, energy access, but uh, so not only comparing how much more energy area do we have compared to a half space, um, but you can uh, use the tilt access. Um, so and then of course all the details are also different to this. Of course, this is a time discretization. This is a gradient flow that we have here. Um, so tilt access. So so an approximation of the following functional. Um, let's say. Something like this, and let's say sigma. So I measure how much, what's the L2 distance of the normal of whatever set I had to a given vector field xi. So you can think of this xi as a constant, just unit, one unit vector. Or, I mean, it, it changes on, on some, some large scale. It's just a continuous function. So the nice thing is that, I mean, both of these things, when I have a fixed set, I can just take the xi here or the sigma star to approximate the, here the normal. It's very obvious that you can, it's just, this is a measurable function. I can approximate this by a continuous function with respect to this measure that I have here. And, and I can make this very small. But of course, I have here something that depends on epsilon. 
first we want to take the abs limit epsilon to zero, and then maybe after that carefully choose the xi. So I'm going to show uh, how to do this very quickly, very briefly, and then. Uh, <coughs> then I want to show you the second result. <coughs> um, so, so what, what we use, what we want to do is we want to uh, write down an approximation of this, of this, of this guy here, kind of an epsilon version epsilon version of the tilt excess. So why, why, is this, why is this important? Because I mean, we're not going to take the equation like this and pass to the limit in the equation. We want to, so this is, this is the goal. Um, so test uh, the Allen Kahn equation over there uh, with, so given a vector field, I'm going to test it with this with this, with this guy here. So this is a function now. Or, or if this is a system, it's still a, a vector field. Um, and then we get here dtu epsilon and that, so I integrate over space and time um, and I get here this again. OK. Um, and you see, if I want to pass to the limit here, um, I have weak times weak convergence here. So the, the gradient of u epsilon, or epsilon times this would only converge weakly, and dt u epsilon only converges weakly. And similar here. So first of all, the, the right-hand side is not so, so, so we want to pass to the limit here. Um, the, this is uh, was already known uh, that so this is the just the first variation uh, of the the energy right with respect to domain variations and and you can write this as just um, the the gradient of this vector field x times some tensor here that I'm not going to write down but um, then here one can pass to the limit and this is was already observed by uh, Lukas and Modica, uh, at least in the case uh, n equal to 1. <coughs> um, so the, the really the, the difficulty is to pass the limit here. So that, um, and for this, we, we define a tilt axis. Um, so, so this here is uh, E for axis. I define this guy here as, I just write down something very similar. Um, and here put the energy density, and let's put maybe a mix of both terms. And this new epsilon is just the normal to the level set. Um, and here I take, I take uh, for the presentation for the moment, n equal to 1. I'll show you how this works and then tell you what happens for, for um, if, it, if you go really to the system case. So because of the energy convergence, you can prove that this here converges to E. Um, so um, the energy convergence, so the E epsilon of U epsilon converges to e, the energy of U. So um, what you do is you, you just write down this thing. And let's ignore that this C has maybe modulus less than 1 sometimes. Let's say it has modulus 1, then this is just 2 minus uh, C times new epsilon. Um, so this is uh, twice just this this mixed term in the energy density um, minus C and now I have new times this guy. This is just uh, and this here. By, by Young's inequality, it's always bounded by the energy density. So um, epsilon halves when you epsilon squared plus 1 over 2 epsilon, just by Young. Um, and it's actually, as epsilon goes to 0, this will give you the same limit as these guys. 
and this here is the gradient of some concatenation of u epsilon with some function phi that satisfies phi of s is uh, So I'm really thinking of, uh, of uh, the scalar case at the moment. And then you can pass to the limit here too. And gives you the, the, the term with xc times the normal. And you, you do this trick here backwards and, uh, and you arrive here. And that's, and that's basically it for the proof. Because now that you, that you have this e epsilon as an error functional that kind of uh, behaves very well. Um, for fixed epsilon, I'm going to replace this term here, which might be oscillating a lot. Um, but I will see with this one here that it doesn't. Um, I can replace epsilon gradient u epsilon as by this guy here, up to an error that I, that I control by this functional here. And then this one here, I can replace by the square root of w of u epsilon. And then these two guys together are going to be the time derivative of exactly this guy here. And that's how you can pass to the limit in this guy, in this term. OK, so maybe that was a little bit fast, but I have the feeling that I'm too slow. I have until. Uh, until six, right? Yes. Okay, great. Um, so, uh, um, so, so I'm going to tell you in a moment what happens when n is greater than one. Um, but uh, are there any questions about this? Because I think somehow maybe uh, I was not perfectly clear. Uh, exactly. So the energy convergence tells you if I, if I call this here uh, a epsilon and b epsilon, tells me that a epsilon squared uh, a epsilon. Uh, uh, let's call this a epsilon squared. 1 half a epsilon squared plus 1 half b epsilon squared converges to, to whatever it is. You always have this inequality. And, and this thing here is the modulus of this guy here by chain rule. Right? So, so, um, and for this one here, you just have lower semi-continuity in, in BV. So this is always going to be, when you take the limit, um, at least greater or equal to um, the gradient of phi of whatever the limit of the u was. That is the limit of these phi of u epsilon. Um, but now u has just finitely many values. In this two-phase case, it just has two values. Either it's in the one well or in the other one. Um, and so phi of u has also just two values. Either it's 0 or it's kind of the distance of these two wells in this funny metric here. So this just has two values. And this is, so this is really the perimeter of the set times this, the gap between the two two values. Um, and this is exactly the energy. Um, and, and, and so this one here um, behaves like the mixed term. This is what I just kind of uh, said, right? And so when I take the difference, I mean, you do some algebra, and you see kind of that, these, that the difference is going to go to 0, actually. <coughs> I mean, so, so this is going to be true. And um, if you take here this. This is going to go to zero as epsilon goes to zero, but it's it's really because of this this assumption here. So if you look at uh, Iman's paper, also uh, your previous work, then then kind of you you uh, don't assume this, and when you don't assume this, then this is uh, this is difficult. <laughs> um, um, so so maybe one word uh, regarding this: um, if you want to prove Bracke's inequality wi with this assumption. It's, it becomes trivial. So, so, and, I mean, so, so, there's, so, so our assumption is very strong, but still we have to work a little bit to get this identity, to get Bracke's inequality with this, with this convergence here. This, this is very easy. So th really, uh, I understand the, the main problem there is th this, this discrepancy measure. Um, here, we kind of uh, get this for free, but uh, still, I mean, there's a little bit one has to do. Yeah. <coughs> okay. So, however, still in this, if you just have two phases, this in the scalar case, 
it's uh, it's kind of really basically actually this this normal converges strongly, right? So uh, so um, so so new epsilon converges strongly in some sense. Um, but uh, this is not the tr not the case, uh, um, or at least if you take here the gradient of u epsilon, this is not the case in the multiphase case. Uh, so let me just tell you what the difference is for for a system. Um, so let's say so this is our physical domain in which we let's say we have two phases. Here u epsilon is basically alpha one, and here u epsilon is basically alpha 2, simplest case I can have. But now these, are, these alpha 1, alpha 2 are vectors in, are points in Rn. So let me go to the, this is where the values of u are. So th and these are the wells of, of w. So this is, let's say, alpha 1, alpha 2, alpha 3, alpha 4, alpha 5. So what's going to happen to, to uh, gradient u epsilon, and I rescale with this epsilon here so that it kind of remains a bounded quantity. As I go from, let's say, as I go along, along this perpendicular to this interface, as I move along here, I'm going to go from alpha 1 to alpha 2. But similar to here, where kind of this square root of w plays an important role, also here, um, you should think of this here as Rn, equipped with uh, with this uh, this metric here, uh, just conform conformally equ um, equivalent to to the Euclidean one. This is the prefactor here. Um, so this the, the the geodesic between this point and this point is not necessarily a straight line with respect to this metric. Right? So this is R n uh, in in the u variable, right? So um, so, so and and maybe. Uh, Trust me on that. Uh, that is uh, proven already uh, um, earlier, and it's basically exactly this inequality, just that um, uh, just in this in this uh, uh, multiphase case, um, you can you get the same that this inequality is sharp at least when you have this energy convergence, and and as you move along here, you will be close to a geodesic, but it's not a straight line. That means that this thing here. As I go from ov here over here to kind of across the interface, is going to oscillate from one vector to another one. Right? It's a matrix; has two components. And what you can actually prove is that um, in in our setting here, that this is going to look like a rank one matrix. The second part of which is the um, the normal here, and the first part is really this this tangent. So this is. Um, So this is so phi i, if phi i is the uh, of u is the distance with respect to this metric of this point to alpha i, then the gradient, as I am close to an interface between phase i and j, um, is going to look like this tangent times the normal, and this also depends on i. I can take i or j; it doesn't matter. But that means that. This doesn't converge strongly. It looks like something that is maybe oscillating. I mean, it is oscillating. And this one here, not. OK, so it looks like a rank 1 matrix. And really, the excess is then kind of the difference of these things here, squared uh, and rescaled. OK. So just, just to make sure that, uh, that I explain this uh, here, that, that uh, the strong convergence here of the normal is not the case, I mean, not for the whole gradient here, full gradient in this vector valued case. So what we see is that it looks like a rank one matrix, right? Like the, uh, like Alberti's rank one theorem that uh, uh, because the limit has just finitely many values, so it just jumps between these two, these several values, the gradient of the limit always has rank 1, right? And these here, approximately 2, then. This is, I mean, this is what we prove. Okay. 
Um, so I think this is what I wanted to tell you about this. I should really get to the, the second result. Um, so the weak, strong uniqueness. Let me just uh, state the theorem right away. So this, uh, as I told you before, is with uh, Julian Fischer, uh, his first PhD student, Sebastian Henze, and uh, uh, and uh, Thilo Simon. Uh, and this is in preparation. Uh, and the, the theorem is the following. Um, um, suppose we have nice and open sets um, um, that give you a strong solution. And here, we really take the spatial dimension equal to 2. So it's networks I think of now. Uh, and and they take a weak solution. Um, uh, a weak solution with uh, um, same initial conditions. So if they start with the same initial conditions, then they are, they are the same. Um, written down, I mean, not with all the small details and so on. Plus, also, we get actually uh, a stability estimate. Um, and, uh, and I want to explain to you how to, how to do this, um, kind of what, what stability estimate is behind this, and how to do the construction. First, a couple of remarks. Uh, first, oh yeah. Uh, so the so the the, the strong notion uh, um, here means uh, thinking of a regular network. So smooth arcs that are that come together only in, tr uh, uh, in triple junctions, and at the triple junctions we have exactly the 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 um, the condition that the the tangents sum to zero, or I mean kind of the triple, um, this one here, long triple jump at the, at the triple junctions. Um, the, the weak solution is, as in the, in the previous theorem, um, um, plus what I, what I didn't write down, optimal energy dissipation relation. So basically, that the time derivative of the energy of this weak solution is bounded by uh, so this is um, easy in our case if we assume this the only um, setup in which we can prove this, this convergence, um, then this, this second assumption here, this really um, follows much easier than, than the actual th this uh, distributional equation. So, so kind of with this, if you buy the, the energy convergence from me, then, uh, then this, this extra energy dissipation relation with the optimal constant um, also holds. And uh, um, I should tell you that there is uh, non-uniqueness. Um, so so um, one can have non-uniqueness, but the theorem says this just happens because of singularities. So um, I think this is uh, um, an example by uh, Jean Taylor, uh, probably when she was here, um, is that you, so think of these, these are the, these are at a right angle, so this is, this is the, these are the coordinate axes. I just turned them a little bit for my drawings. Um, so I have two ways how this could split up. Uh, 
in two ju triple junctions that go this way or two triple junctions that go this way. Um, and, and there's no, no reason why I should choose one over the other. Um, and I'm using this in this multiphase setting because now I can, uh, uh, I can show you that you can also easily get there. So when t is less than t0, if you have one grain in the middle that will disappear, so omega 1, 2, 3, 4, and there's one other grain that, that disappears that's going to shrink, um, you can very easily, I mean, you can you just arrive here, right? Um, so here with, these are 120 degrees angles, and these are circular arcs here. So this is a self shrinker. Um, so when such a grain vanishes, for example, you can arrive at such a very um, symmetric situation and you have non-uniqueness. Um, and our theorem says this just happens because, uh, because there was a singularity. If there was no singularity, this couldn't happen. Um, so that's the second remark. The third one is uh, the key tool. Um, key tools um, is relative entropy and calibrations. Um, so relative entropy is like a, is a functional which you can really think of an error functional that is kind of really adapted to your problem. Uh, goes back to uh, De Fermos and uh, independently De Perna. Um, and has been applied to a lot of uh, situations uh, since then. So maybe in, uh, uh, in geometry, maybe it's, uh, uh, it's uh, I should maybe just say the very uh, um, related things. So um, Bob Gerard and Didier Smets used this for binormal curvature flow. And um, Julian and uh, Sebastian did this for two-phase flow. Um, for two liquids with different viscosity but surface tension between them, um, you can also write down an, a relative entropy, a relative entropy f functional. But all this is without triple junctions like, like we would have here. Um, and here our relative entropy functional is just going to be the, the same thing that we had before. It's just the, the, the tilt excess. So let me write this down once more and let me expand the square. Um, so I just, and because before I didn't write down the whole um, thing with the sum. So this is it's just the same function as we had before. <coughs> the question is, what are the Xs that I want to plug in here? And these are calibrations that I, that I want to construct. So. So here, the, the sigma here is the weak solution. So we have here two worlds. This is the weak solution for which I want to write down the relative entropy functional. And on the other side, we have the strong solution for which, from which I want to construct a calibration. So this here will be like a time-dependent calibration, uh, really uh, what, uh, what uh, um, people did in the static case already. And indeed, I was too slow. Uh, so um, let me give you the idea of, pro of the proof. Uh, OK, so it's really um, there are these two worlds, kind of the, the weak solution for which I want to kind of compute what's happening with this relative entropy. And then I want to construct these vector fields that then I plug in into this computation that I construct from the strong solution. So the first part of the proof is uh, the weak solution and relative entropy. So I'm going to do this now for, for two phases for the moment. Uh, so, so what you want to do is you want to get, so this is our error functional. What we want to prove is dE dt 
is bounded by E. And then we do Gronwa. That's what we want to do. OK, so we, um, we compute the derivative. So this is now just two phases. So it's just, I compute this is 1 times the integral. So this is just the area of the interface. Um, so And sigma is the boundary of some set. And the second term is, uh, is just the integral over, this, over the surface of xi times nu. OK, so I'm just copying what I have here without the indices and so on. It's just, to, just um, one set um, whose boundary is going to evolve. And this is, um, this is the, what we have here. So I'm going to use for this first term the optimal energy dissipation relation. This is minus v squared. Right? This is the weak solution. For this guy, I know at least this inequality for the first term. And for the second term, that's actually the reason why I write this down for just two phases. Um, now it's just, I mean, uh, with uh, the divergence theorem, this is just um, the divergence of xi over the set. Otherwise, there's some algebra if you have several phases. Um, and then I can take the time derivative of this. And there's the weak solution. But for the weak solution, we still know if I have a test function int integrated over the set, right? this is going to give me exactly, I mean, OK, the time derivative of the test function. And the other guy is going to be kind of when the derivative falls onto this one, it's v times this guy over the boundary. So I get v times whatever test function I had over the boundary. And then I get the derivative on this guy, and I undo this integration by parts, and I get uh, dtx times nu. OK, so we have this inequality. And you see this guy here uh, is our friend, because it's, it's I mean, minus a square. So this, this is dissipating. right? Uh, then this term here, maybe at the moment we're not bothered by, by this one. Uh, but this one here is really bad, because it has the v inside, for which we just have L2 bonds somehow. So I really have to absorb this guy and this one here. OK, here it's just linear, here it's quadratic. So somehow this seems reasonable. And uh, I can't show you the whole computation, because it's, uh, I mean, you have to kind of do some algebra and then use uh, um, the, so one important one important thing is that we also have this distributional equation. And we're going to use that one too. We're going to test this equation, um, equation b, with x an extension of, um, of the velocity field of the strong solution. OK, so my calibration will not, be, not only be this vector fields, these vector fields that kind of extend the normal vector fields, but because it's d dynamic, I mean, there's also, um, also the normal, normal velocity is going to play a role. OK, and then, um, then after this, you arrive at uh, clean identity uh, and a long wish list for xi these vector fields for each interface. I mean, so here it's just for one, but in general, there will be several ones. And this vector field x, which is the velocity at which everything is moving. So let me write down the wish list and then explain to you how I do this at a triple junction. Can I get four more minutes? OK. OK, so basically, so four things I would like to have from these, from these vector fields. So I mean, here I just do the computation. And then I don't show you, but kind of I put all the difficulty in these, in these guys here. OK, so what I would like to have is, first of all, that xi, I mean, of course, xi um, should be the, and, and maybe, maybe before I do this, Let's switch gears and go to the, I mean, so now I did all this. I used the, the weak solution. So now I forget that the weak solution exists, and I tell you what I want to do from the strong solution. So uh, 
forget weak solution. Um, so we're now going to do the second step, strong solution and calibration. So I want to do this now so that here I don't have to put stars everywhere. So here there's no weak solution anymore. So this is the, so this is the on the strong solution, this is the, this should be the, just the normal vector field. And then it should be extended um, such that the, the, the modulus is going to be less than one outside. And I would like to have that the divergence of these guys um, So this here should be small. So it should be O of Sij. So Sij is the uh, sine distance function. Um, OK. So let me not show you the next two ones and just show you these two. And imagine this was a 0, really. And x was 0. So this, it's not moving. Then this is just a, a calibration. Divergence free, right, and and extends the normal vector field. Okay, so this would just be a calibration, but now it's time dependent, so it doesn't solve mean curvature equal to zero, but mean curvature equal to normal velocity, with a minus, right? Okay, and then here actually we allow for for some because I mean then you see here kind of doesn't have to be zero, just has to be kind of linearly small, um, and then kind of there should be some connection between x and x, um, so x, the x should be um, transported uh, by x uh, to first order in this uh, SIJ. So on the surface, it's really transported by the x because the surface is transported by x. But as you go away, this is still approximately true. And for the modulus, this should be true even to second order. OK. so. This is a long wish list, and here's, here's how you can construct them. So if you just have one interface, um, this, is, I mean, this is really what, uh, um, what uh, for example, Meta did, um, that you, you take, this is the gradient of the distance function. Right? I mean, this is, this, was, this is really crucial. You can take the gradient of the distance function, um, um, then maybe cut it off so that you get this strictly less than 1. Um, and, and you will get this here. Of course, there will be an error term, right? But this is what we allow for, right? OK. So this is basically what you can do for one interface. What I want to show you is that you can also do this for a triple junction, for example. OK. So let's say <coughs> we have a triple junction. And let's say all the surface tensions are the same, right? So, so we have here, these are 120 degrees, all of them. And we have here omega 1, omega 2, omega 3. So. I want to do two steps. First, I want to um, want to define x. So the the, the um, this is extension of uh, velocity field. So for example, this arc here is moving by mean curvature. So the normal velocity is very little, but it goes in this direction, okay, and so on. And this one goes this in this direction, and this one goes in this direction. However. The normal velocity now is not enough, really, to characterize this, because you have this triple point. And if I say they just move in normal direction, then this guy can't move anywhere. right? Can't move in this direction, can't move in this direction, and then you're already done. So you need to say, so if I let's write down a proxy. So let's say, for example, close to this interface, sigma 1, 2, I take x1, 2 tilde, should be what you expect the normal velocity to be. right? So this is exactly the normal velocity, and have all the freedom uh, um, to, to write down the tangential velocity. Right? Here, you don't see this in the, it's just a reparameterization. But at this point, it has to be the velocity of p in this direction. So let's call this alpha 1, 2 is some function I can choose in the tangential direction. Okay. And then the real, the real ansatz is actually you take another f function beta um, times, um, so a linear correction. Uh, in uh, also in the normal in the tangential direction. <coughs> this is how you can now define the how you can extend this velocity field. So first of all, this moves in some way. So I'm going to give all of these guys like a little bit of a tangential velocity that kind of they look the same at this point, right? 
And now, at least close to this interface, I could just extend by, by I mean, extending uh, in the normal direction here. Just, and I can actually do this everywhere here, right? This would be my C12 tilde. And over here, I can also extend this guy here, right? That would gi give me a C23 tilde. So I get C23 tilde and C X31 tilde um, similarly. And then I can take X, some interpolation of the X tildes. That was the, the easy part, and now I'm just going to show you in a picture how to do the, the interesting part, how to, de how to extend um, the normal vector fields. So I'm drawing the same picture again, just that now I'm looking at the normal vector fields. So this is new one, two. <coughs> so, and what I'm going to do, so this is B, the Cijs. And so what I'm going to do first, I'm going to again define a C tilde. And this I can only define again kind of in this half space where I can have like a nice nearest point projection onto this guy and close to this, but that doesn't matter. The problem is I can't define it here across the triple point. So I take here the normal, project it down, kind of if I want to evaluate it here, I go to the nearest point compute the normal. Um, and, uh, and I have to take some corrections here. So maybe notably, the um, you have this, this uh, alpha. You take this as a tangential correction. Um, so it's going to rotate a little bit. So then I have to kind of, because this changes the length, I have to subtract something. And then we also c get another term here like this. But it's not too important how it looks exactly. The kind of the really the interesting part now is that I can do this for this guy, right? So I can define a vector field here. So I just extend this and I correct this kind of um, a little bit in the tangential, so, so kind of in this direction. It can turn a little bit. This is kind of the freedom I want to give myself. But I have no idea how to define C12 here. And what we do now is here is uh, the other interface sigma 2, 3. So for the velocity, I could just take the velocity of the other interface. Here, of course, I can't take this vector field because, I mean, they don't look even similar here, right? But I know exactly how they relate to each other by a rotation by 120 degrees. So what I do is I, um, uh, what we do is, so we do the same, some, uh, um, we do the same ansatz here for this guy with respect to this interface. So we just take new 2, 3 plus kind of all this stuff. We do the same construction for here. And um, looks very different, of course. But now we say we define xi, 1, 2. And I can do the same down here for the, um, so this is going to be an interpolation of xi, 1, 2, rotation of xi, 2, 3 and the inverse rotation of C3, uh, 1, where this rotation is by uh, now minus 120 degrees, right? So I rotate it back to this. And the, really the, the, the funny thing here is that um, they will, of course, give you the same value here. So of course, it's continuous, what I'm, what I'm defining here. But actually, this C12 um, that I define here uh, is C2. If I, I mean, so I didn't show you these two corrections. It's not so, not so bad. It's just two, two terms like up there. Um, it's C2 up to this point. So the, it's very nicely compatible here. Uh, and the x is C1. So, I'm, so, so what you have to do, uh, so this construction. So then you have to interpolate here a little bit. So you lose a little bit. So it's W2 infinity and W1 infinity then in the end. But kind of before you interpolate here, because you're interpolating on a very sh short range here, um, uh, you are actually C2 um, on each of these wedges. And, and kind of this really will satisfy these things. And they're going to be C2 and uh, C1. OK, so, so I'm going to stop here. And uh, yeah, I'm happy to take questions. <coughs>